I don't really care about the who, what, when, where, why stuff. I care about who is not being seen, mm -hmm. who is not being heard, who is not being loved, and who is not being attended to. And those are the good ways to sort of look at the world, I think. You're listening to Easy Cook Bear, a food and culture show about how we cook, connect, and create. My name is Lee Sean. I'm a queer Taiwanese-American immigrant, designer, and passionate home cook. Together with my guests, we'll be sharing stories, swapping recipes, and exploring the creative processes of people who make art, culture, food, music, and more. Easy Cook Bear. Our guest today is the author of the memoir, Born in Bedlam. And he's also a freelance writer who has written for a whole slew of publications. It's sort of like the alphabet of publications, but I'll just name a few. The New Yorker, The New York Times, New York Magazine, BBC, Bloomberg, Bon Appetit, The Economist. I could just keep going and going. Check out more about him on his website, Charm and Rigor, which is an anagram for his real name, Richard Morgan. Richard, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Alicia. So what is the last thing you've eaten today? I go across the street to this Asian fusion sort of sandwich place, and I get a um, a curry fried chicken bun. Ooh! So that's it's like my usual lunch, and then I go across the street again to a different place, and I get a um, mango boba that has exploding mangoes. I think they call it exploding mangoes, and they're they're not boba like tapioca. They're like, yeah, they're just little spheres. They're kind of gushers, and okay. you, you just chew on them, and they burst in your mouth. Anyway, so it's really great. There's this um, very complicated order that I've made there. That now we have a shorthand. We just call it mango love potion there, and then I get this. Um, well, before that, I get the. Uh, curry fried chicken banh mi. And so it's like marinated in curry and then fried, or is it fried chicken with like a curry sauce? No, yeah, that's what I like about it. It's the curry is under the skin. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's, nice. Um, yeah. They don't make their own bread, but their bread is really good. So let's back up a little because you mostly live in New York, but for most of this pandemic time, you've been based in San Francisco, right? I've been in San Francisco since July. I was in New York from the pandemic's beginning until then. And I've also been in LA and back to New York. So I've sort of been going all over. But yeah, those are the two main chapters, New York and then San Francisco. And so as a writer, as a journalist, you've been covering COVID stories, but I'm sure other stories and other work as well. But you also recovered from COVID yourself, right? And then you got up and started reporting on COVID on the West Coast. Is that what happened? Yeah, I was, I'm a freelancer, as maybe people could tell from, from your introduction. So I was covering the crisis as it emerged in New York when, in, you know, in March, April, May, when New York was really the sort of centerpiece of, of the crisis. And I was covering that for the Washington Post and then got COVID. And I wow. had a 18-day um, fever of about 103 degrees and extreme, extreme fatigue. Um, I didn't lose my sense of smell or taste, but extreme fatigue, some body soreness, and the fever. Those were my sort of main markers. And I was also um, living by myself. So it was, it was a lot of, um, it was a lot of stress. And how are you feeling these days? These days are, I'm fine. So I came back to, I, what I did is I, I sort of recovered and then although COVID recovery is a sort of loose term. And then I was like, I really just want to be somewhere super pleasant. And so I came to San Francisco where it's, you know, like 60 degrees and sunny every day and great air. Um, and then, of course, the wildfires came, and we had this weird orange sky day. Uh, I don't even remember what day that was. But, um, you know, I had to actually shelter in place, even though there was not a shelter in place order, just because there was an, um, I needed to check air quality every day. 
And my uh, infection in May, my COVID infection in May, scarred my lung tissue and gave me reduced or diminished lung capacity. Oh, wow. So some breathing is complicated for me now. But yeah, I came to San Francisco, and now yeah, there's been the the wildfires are gone, and now it's just uh, been nonstop sunny, sixty degree days. So it's pretty pleasant. That's great. And what brought you to San Francisco? Was it a particular story, or just for a change of scenery? I just like the Bay. I grew up liking San Francisco. I don't know. It just had this like weird magnetism about it. It's kind of Parisian in its like. I mean, now it has a little too many skyscrapers but it just has you know the sort of palace of fine arts and coit tower and the golden gate bridge um and the ferry building it's just very sort of simple simple town and you know by the bay and i don't know i guess i also i'm also a sucker for the beatnik bohemian movement there and also the uh gay movement there i'm gay so as you know but uh and now everybody listening to this podcast knows as well. Yeah. Oh, that you're, well, okay, yeah, that I'm gay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I say that in my intro too. I, I talk about being queer in my intro sequence. Yeah. So I don't know. I, San Francisco always held this like heavy, oh, and I'm a Trekkie, as you know as well. All right. Starfleet Academy. Yeah. So it's like the headquarters. But I was always fascinated by the fact that the UN charter was like signed here. Like, what was so amazing about San Francisco in 1945? Anyway, San Francisco, it's a super pleasant place to be. It's very manageable. I could see that. I lived there for a summer. I was interning there for a summer in grad school, and it seemed like a nice change from New York. And yeah, very manageable. It's very like um, counterpoint. It's not like antithetical to New York, but it's very counterpoint. I just wanted like a good counterpoint. So that's what I have. You know what I miss most about San Francisco food-wise is actually Burmese food. Have you had any Burmese food while you've been out there? No, there's actually some cool Burmese food carts in New York right when the pandemic was starting. Um, there was like, a, I think one in Rockefeller Center and some in Queens. But no, I, ha- I haven't had Burmese food yet. I did have really good Georgian food. And... <clears throat> um, Good Guamanian, Guamanian oh, wow. food. I've never had that. What was that like? You know, so it's a lot like Filipino food. You know, it's mm-hmm. sort of this like native plus Asian colonialism plus American military colonialism. It's sort of like Filipino food, but I don't recall there being any spam. Mm-hmm. And it was much more sort of like caribbean almost in that it's like coconutiness oh interesting and kind of like um sort of like roasted meat kind of thing i feel like filipino food is maybe a little saucy and this was more sort of like the actual items but it was really solid it was just oh you know what also really impressed me is that they had really great cocktails that were like it's really hard to do a cocktail that that feels distinct that feels culturally distinct. Right. Because a lot of it's like, oh, this is our version of a martini, or this is our version of a michelada, or whatever. Right, and it doesn't fall into that, like, tiki revival kind of kitsch, either. Yeah, yeah. It was really just, like, the flavor. I don't even remember the... I'm sorry I didn't do my homework. But, like, the... I don't... uh, the, The flavors were just like, wow, this feels really good. You know, I recently ate at an Indian restaurant that had cantaloupe juice Ooh. in a cocktail. It was like Aperol and cantaloupe juice. And I was like, that sounds like something I should have had before, but I have not. And it was really solid. And it was a really smart, it kind of, if you can picture tasting a cantaloupe, it kind of tasted Indian. It was like not mango lassi, which was great, but it was sort of like inspired by mango lassi, I think. I don't know. Yeah, that's so interesting. I don't think I've ever had cantaloupe in an Indian food context at all. Well, I mean, there's not very many cocktails in New York, at least, that in New York's broad cocktail culture that even used cantaloupe. I asked some bartenders about it, and I heard that cantaloupe doesn't produce a lot of juice. It's not very, like, juice efficient. Hmm. So it's either, it's kind of wasteful slash indulgent, 
you know, it's much better to get like watermelon juice or um, something like that. So watermelon juice was like a big thing in smoothies and cocktails for the last, like, I don't know, like two or three years. But um, yeah, cantaloupe, it was really solid. It kind of has that creaminess, that sort of low key creaminess that cantaloupes have, the sort of like round, silky sort of taste. Anyway, it was really good. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm just slowly getting into melon again. I used to really dislike it as a kid. And I think I had a bad experience as a kid, like choking on a seed on a watermelon and then throwing up. And then I just associated that with like all melons. But now I'm like slowly getting back into it. So that's something. Also, I- so this is a t- this is the thing that typically happens with food, I think, is when I think of a really sad cafeteria dessert, like fruit cup, Mm -hmm. or like a nursing home fruit cup that is like grapes some like honeydew or cantaloupe and maybe some pineapple yeah and it's like saturated in syrup so that's kind of what most people think of do you sort of have to unlearn a lot of ingredients and sort of remember that they are can actually be you know, there's always this sort of an Olive Garden moment where you go to Tuscany and you realize that no one actually eats the things in Olive Garden. Right. So you have to, you know, meet the food on its own terms. Um, but there's so much of that that we think we know what this, what this tastes like. And we don't because we just don't really, we're not very, um, people are very curious about their own food experiences. They just assume that they know food. Everyone eats. So everyone thinks they know food. Everyone thinks they know what spice is. Everyone thinks they know what flavor is. They also think things like heat and spice and flavor and fire are all sort of the same thing. Like, yeah. Like not at all the same thing. So anyway, it was a cantaloupe cocktail at an Indian restaurant. So I'm going to out you for a different thing now. You are a Brit with an American accent and you're also Palestinian. So I like to ask my guests about their culinary heritage. Like, what kind of food did you grow up with, or what do you consider to be your like comfort food? So there was this meal that my, I, you know, I wrote about this in a food magazine, an indie food magazine. Your reader, I mean, your listeners might know, called Gather Gather Journal, which was really great. I wrote about this dish that my my so my mother is Palestinian and met my father in university in London. So there was this meal that I used to have as a kid that was sort of like my version of a casserole. Mm -hmm. Cause I never had, I never had like casserole or meatloaf or anything like that, that I always saw like on TV. But we had this dish that was like a really fluffy yellow rice with ground beef, peas, sort of like fried almonds, almond slices, and like a dollop of really sour yogurt on top. And you kind of mix it in. And, you know, I don't know the name. I don't speak Arabic, but um, the Arabic name for it is something like rice with a face. If any of your listeners find out what it's called, I would love to get it because I wrote it down one time, but then I lost that piece of paper. (laughs) As as I often do. And what is the face? Like, does that refer to the meat or the, how it's decorated? Yeah, I think it just means like dressed up rice. Rice that's like not plain. I don't know. I'm just sort of assuming that. But like, uh, yeah, rice with a face. And then also, we also had a lot of tabbouleh. So like, I, I beat everyone to tabbouleh. You were doing the tabbouleh before it was cool? Were you doing hummus before it was cool? <laughs> Here's what would happen. You would open, I mean, I'm sure you, as a Taiwanese American, would have similar experiences, you know, in your lunchbox or whatever. Mm-hmm. At me as a kid, I would open the fridge. I grew up in D.C., at this point, we had moved here from London. So I opened the fridge and instead of having that sort of a sunny D moment where you're like, oh, purple stuff and pop tarts and whatever, it was just, there would be like the giant punch bowl of lentils that were like soaking up water for mm-hmm. the tabbouleh. And you'd be like, okay, well, that's kind of what we're, uh, that's what's going on later. You could tell it was, this is what's going to happen later. It was this very sort of ominous bowl that that occupied my fridge as a kid. And so it pushed out all of these American childhood things like Sunny Delight and what were those Capri Suns and things like that? 
So I don't really know what your family was like, but my family was really into sort of they they were sort of an Ellis Island family. That's like you come here and you do the things that Americans do. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of like there was a lot of pizza. There was a lot of like Velveeta. There was a lot of like TV dinners and stuff like that. It was a lot of like making your own stuff. But there was not this sort of like um, archetype or this sort of like um, this sort of cultural cultural promise of, of food, which was like casseroles and like pot roast. And there was no pot roast, no casseroles. I always saw this ham in cartoons and in like TV shows, like the Brady Bunch or something. That was like a ham with slices of pineapple like pinned to it with cherries in in the middle yeah i don't think i've ever had that but you know what it is right you know what it you you can picture it right yeah i've totally seen it in cookbooks and on blogs and things like that yeah so i never had that i never had the jello with the marshmallows in it and i also you know there was all these things sandwiches were like a really big deal for me as a kid and there were all these sandwiches that you just didn't get I just never, I never had like a Reuben until I was like, I don't know. I must've been like 20. I don't think I had one until I moved to New York. Like I didn't even know what that was. Yeah. But there was like, I just, you know, so in England, which is not the habit in America, when, whenever you make any sandwich, like even just like um, a ham and cheese sandwich, you butter both pieces of bread. And it just sort of like gives the sandwich like a next level. You know, like Britain has a really big sandwich culture. I mean, Loki invented it, whatever. I know that's going to ruffle some feathers. I mean, it's named after it's the, the sandwich guy, right? right? Yeah. The laziest poker player ever, a card player or whatever he was doing. But um, yeah, so the Earl of Sandwich. But I mean, just because Britain, just because Brits named it, that doesn't make it, you know, they invented it. But uh, yeah, you know, they have like the Plowman Sandwich, right? The sort of like, um, I was just thinking about the Plowman Sandwich earlier today. But you know, all those like... Um, like bacon bap, like there's a big sandwich culture in in Britain, right? And anyway, so uh, you know, we would just do a lot of that. But yeah, I never got any of this like really archetypal. I felt like I was not. There was a certain kind of not America, but Americana mm-hmm. that was that we just couldn't. When you immigrate here, you can perform America, but it's really hard to perform Americana. What do you mean by that? So there's just lots of things that we knew how to, we knew that this was what was expected, but there was no sense of exactly how to do it. Yeah. I was the oldest. And so I knew that I had to go to like prom, but I didn't really know how to do that. Yeah. And it was not like I could ask my parent, what was your prom like or whatever, you know? So there was all these things, homecoming, prom, like there's a lot of figuring stuff out. And even things like sleepovers, because uh, Britain doesn't really do sleepovers, and sleepovers, and um, I don't know, just all these like sort of camping trips and things, Boy Scouts. I just never really knew everything. It was always like someone who had um, watched the movie but not read the book. That's kind of how I felt. Yeah, yeah, I feel like that too. Like we weren't really allowed to do sleepovers for a long time, and then. We would like watch things on TV and learn how to cook them. Or if we were home by ourselves, we would just get like microwave dinners and cook those. But when my mom cooked, it was more like Taiwanese food. And then um, we would like go out and eat things. But yeah, a lot of things I like learned how to cook later on in adulthood or like learned about them from TV. Yeah, I just never really learned how to. I mean, I don't really, I mean, it's a callback and stuff, but like I just don't really, as a single person, there's not a lot of like, benefit to cooking by yourself i don't think you know like i what i don't want is a fridge full of like oh here's the cheese that i didn't finish using and here's the like the garlic that i didn't finish using and here's the all these other things i never want to be that that iron chef person who has to like make a meal out of lots of half used things or just throw it all away it's sort of like like, what's the point right i just eat i also am never gonna make like larb at home or whatever right so um i'm just gonna go out i just go out uh, a lot which is probably um 
probably if I actually looked at that, like <laughs> budget wise, it would be a nightmare. Right. But I don't know. I mean, I think that that's as a single person, you can maybe do that a little bit more. Do you remember the last thing you actually cooked for yourself? I don't really remember. I did make this like, I didn't, I didn't make it though. I, I like, it was a thing that a friend brought over from like Costco or something. It was like some like broccoli stuffed chicken that you just sort of like heat up. Yeah. Uh, I just did that. I mean, it was just like, I don't, I don't really even do that really. I mean, you know, um, it's very interesting. So this place I'm in in San Francisco, it doesn't have a microwave. Interesting. It's really sort of both subtly and dramatically like sort of reordered the way. I don't know if you've ever looked at the non-microwave directions of things, but it is insane. Yeah, it's not actually convenient, right? Or it just takes forever to it's frozen dinner. instructions are always like this. Put in the microwave for four minutes and then take it out wait one minute or something like that. The non-microwave instructions are like preheat the oven. Do not put this, this tray in the oven. You have to take mm-hmm. it out of its little like plastic tray or whatever. And then separate, you know, it's like a whole, and then it's also like, instead of four minutes, it's like 25 minutes. It's crazy. So yeah, that's also contributed to um, not cooking at home. Yeah. I, you know, when I was talking about rice, rice with a face, mm-hmm. the other thing is that I felt like I was the only kid in Potomac, Maryland <laughs> <laughs> who ate beans on toast for our breakfast. That was just like a major breakfast. That was like my breakfast was beans on toast and muesli. We had a lot of muesli. We would like beg for like Lucky Charms and things like that. And we would get like one box for like four, four kids. And it would, you know. But yeah, beans on toast. That was just like, I just thought of that as breakfast. And I don't know, I haven't had beans on toast. I mean, I probably only had beans on toast in Britain since then. But you just go to school and you just don't realize how different you are from your just your morning. Just your sort of wake up routine has already set you on a different path for the day. You know, so it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild when you're a kid how little you know about how different you are, but also how much you sort of sense that you're very different. Yeah, let's go back to Gather. And what what was the piece you were writing for them? Oh, so Gather doesn't exist anymore. I think it's, I mean, it does exist, but it doesn't, it hasn't put out a new issue in like two or three years. But Gather was run by a friend of mine, Fiorella Valdesolo, who is worth, um, I mean, definitely go down any rabbit hole that sh- that you can find with her. But every issue was themed. Mm-hmm. And instead of being sort of stupidly themed, like lots of food magazines are, like Thanksgiving or Celebration, or like it's all about lobster, or it's all about cheese, or, you know, whatever. It's It was like these concepts. And so the first one was about summer movies. And... She, I said, she said, hey, listen, I would like for you to write a little, a very short, it's really hard to write like 300 words, 300 words about a tribute to Bloody Marys. And I was like, oh, I can do that. And she was like, but it also has to be about West Side Story. Wow. That's quite the brief. And she goes, are you up for that? And I was like, I'm very up for that because I have no idea if I can do it. Yeah. So that made me want to do it so much. Bloody Marys occupy this weird space in cocktails where no one orders them at the bar and no one really orders them at like dinner. You only really have it at brunch. And so the brunch became a sort of like time and place for us to have Bloody Marys, just like Tony and Maria you know, that song somewhere. Oh, so there's a place for us. Yeah. A time and place for us, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so it was that, you know? So it was like, oh, that this thing, which is sort of outcast, it has a home. It just doesn't have a big home. But when it does hit that spot, it really, really delivers. 
And so then I was just so into that, so into that, like, I don't know, the sort of like leap of faith that I took in the writing and the, and the thought process that went into it. Because a lot of food writing, it just really suffers from two things. One, just the sort of like really indulgent, insane use of adjectives. Yeah. And, you know, that's the sort of, people might know that as the kind of bullshit that people say when they're describing wines. You know, like notes of this or whatever, like, yeah. you know, like notes of almond and stone fruit and cat piss. Yeah. But also like notes of like autumn and regret. You know, <laughs> and you're like, what? What? Okay. I sense that the, I sense that the Bittner was going through a divorce during this season or something. You know, it's like, right. What? Um, so there's that. And then there, the other thing is the sort of like really sort of flashcard braggy homework like homework braggarts like the kind of people who would like really roll into the r's in burrito yeah the kind of gringos that really roll into the r's of burrito or like the overpronouncers the overpronouncers the people who the people who say oh you're using like a hong kong based soup it's like what it's just soup bro like calm down Right. You know, oh, you're not using the typical Tuscan one. You're using the Sicilian recipe. Okay. Well, it's just a salad, whatever. You know, so there's just a little bit of like, I don't know. Yeah. There's kind of like the people who keep track of how many countries they've visited, those people. Yeah. So how do you avoid that yourself? So I don't really think of it as food. I don't really care about the food. I care about the story that is being expressed in it. So just to get back together a little bit, because I'll, I'll make it all relate, is there was this one issue that was like natural history. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote about all the animals that I'll never get to eat because they're extinct. And so I never get to know if like triceratops is good or not. <laughs> um, but there's famous food that has been hunted to extinction because it was so tasty. So I wrote about this bird called the great auk that was kind of like this penguin. And the last great auk was stolen um, by like Scottish or Irish pirates and tied on a boat for three days while they were like plotting to eat it. And then there was a storm and they thought that the auk was a witch and they threw it overboard. Wow. That's like 1800 and I don't know, 1810. I'm making that up, but it was like something like that. It was like not that far long ago. And, uh, you know, there's like, there's lots of things like that. There's this guy who found this a scientist or something who found a uh, mastodon that was like really well preserved. Mm -hmm. And so he immediately made stew out of it. And like, and like this like research base ate like mastodon stew. So there's lots of things like that. Like, you know, so you take a concept. You, so with Gather, it would always take a concept. Like there was this one about magic. And so I wrote about how people are really proud of making guacamole or adding like Thai basil into something as, as opposed to basil, yeah. you know, and they sort of treat it like a sort of like a witch's brew, you know, like eye of newt, basil of Thai, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, yeah. right? And the mortar and pestle of like, I, I can make guac, right? It's like, it's very sort of magician-y or sorcerer, sorcerer kind of vibe. And so that relates something that everyone knows, but you wouldn't really think of it unless you had to think about food in through the lens of magic. There was an issue about colors. And so I wrote about blue because blue is, is very unnaturally occurring. Mm -hmm. And actually the only blue that we know Blue is the only color that has a flavor because blue raspberry was created in like the 70s. And that's basically the only thing that is blue. There's blueberries, right? Blueberries aren't super blue. They're called blueberries, but they're really kind of purple. Yeah. You know, like blue, like blue, blue, you know, azul, you know, that. Yeah. That's basically just blue ras, you know. Yeah, there's that Thai blue rice, but it, the rice itself is not blue. It's dyed blue from this flower, but it doesn't really taste like anything. No, I had that rice the other day. It was funny. We opened it uh, here in San Francisco. We opened it um, like right around the election, and we opened this rice 
from this Thai place and it was blue. And we were like, wow, even the, even the rice is going blue. <laughs> it's the blue rice wave. Yeah, even the rice, like, with, like Arizona flipped blue, my rice flipped blue. But I think if you think about food in this way other than, so many people think about food only in terms of like, what's the price? Is it cool? How does it Instagram? Are there like exotic or what they perceive to be exotic ingredients? And is there like a sort of crazy story, right? Like this is the soup that like King Henry used to drink or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And other than that, they're not really that curious about food. If you ask people something like what their last meal should be, that that's like when people start getting revealing about food, right? Like what would their last meal be or what's something that they've always wanted to make or, you know, things like that. Is there something like, why, like, you know, why don't, if they like cranberry sauce so much or pumpkin pie so much, why don't they eat that all the time? You know, if you just ask people these questions that they normally don't get asked, um, it can be, you know, quite revealing. So that is what I really liked about Gather. And Gather actually probably is what made me a food journalist. Uh, I mean, not, I don't really think of myself as a food writer or food journalist, but it got me into including food in my sort of repertoire. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing too is just to write it as a pure outsider, but not as a sort of like conquistador or sort of colonial imperial approach, right? To write about it as an outsider, but as an outsider, like any guest, like who fully defers to the person doing it, you know, the, the staff or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I'll learn a lot about a culture that I'm writing about, um, we, you know, whether that's a chopped cheese in the Bronx or like an empanada in the Bronx or Chinese food in Egypt, you know, or the differences between like Eastern Indian food and South Indian food and whatever. So there's all of that. Plus, you know, I tend to think all of all my work, all my journalism as answering I don't really get, I don't really care about the who, what, when, where, why stuff. I care about who is not being seen, mm -hmm. who is not being heard, who is not being loved, and who is not being attended to. And those are the good ways to sort of look at the world, I think. So like with the who is not being loved kind of thing, like there might be a thing that everyone knows, like, um, like ranch dressing, but nobody yeah. cares about it. Right. Nobody knows where it came from. Nobody really values it. It's just part of the water now, right? It's just like the water we swim in. David Chang, he's not going to tell you about, oh, I have a great, I have a great ranch dressing recipe. You know? Yeah. It's just not something people really care about. But if you get into it, it's actually super interesting. So, you know, I think about that. And I think about, um, I also think, you know, in terms of this cross-cultural moment that we're in with food or really what it really is is a cosmopolitan moment with food a true cosmopolitanism moment with food is that there are so many stories that are like written about korean barbecue and they're written by korean writers and it's fine that's good but i would love to have a korean writer cover a new french restaurant yeah or some like Nordic avant-garde cuisine covering a new burrito place. Yeah. That's like what's necessary. Otherwise, you're just sort of, there's kind of this minstrel kind of problem of like, oh, of course, this Chinese person is going to write about Chinese food, or, you know, have a food channel show about uh, Chinese food. But you never, you know, who's that guy, Lishan? Who's that guy that we used to watch, the East West guy? Ming Tsai. East meets West. I totally grew up with that guy. You would never let him make a burrito. You know? Totally. Because the whole thing is like, oh, just make orange, not even real Chinese food, like make orange chicken or whatever, right? Like use a, make sure you use a wok, right? Make sure yeah. it looks, make sure it looks Chinese. I've been to his restaurant and I think he's the real deal, but I think it's very much that time period as well, where he was in this role of kind of introducing certain aspects of Asian cooking to a mostly white American audience, sort of like Martin Yan before that. Julia Child introduced the world to French food and she's not French. So yeah, I think, yeah, there just needs to be a lot of like 
really doing your homework and not doing the thing of like, it's insane that they're eating like pho for breakfast. It's like, no, that's what like Vietnamese people do. Like it's like a meal all throughout the day. It's not just a, your lunch break and, you know, happy hour or dinner time or whatever. Right. That's why I hate those stories that are like, if you like pho, discover this new Cambodian soup, or it's like everything has to be like put in a in a box, right? Or we can only handle one Asian noodle soup at a time. And then the next one is going to replace the old one. But back to what you were saying about the cosmopolitan moment that we're living. Yeah. I think that's why I find so compelling these YouTube videos that are like Korean grandma tries Mexican food for the first time, right? I love that Korean grandma. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Well, she's also so positive, which is also what I mean. You know, there's there's not no one. Pete Wells is not going to go all the way to some small town just to shit on that food, right? You know, so there's a lot of positivity in food, but I think that's like worthwhile, right? Unless you're sort of taking down a giant, um, you know, you should mostly, mostly be sort of encouraging or building up or at least being not a cheerleader, but like helpful to the audience. Right. Like what good is it to tell an audience, to tell a reader or a listener or a viewer, Oh, like, don't bother with this. Cause they're gonna, they're gonna bother with it anyway. You know? Yeah. And if, I think if like an elite critic says like, Oh, don't, try it. It's not worth it. it. In some ways that makes me more curious about something. Yeah. I mean, also maybe they just did it wrong. Like they're not good. I mean, food critics are almost all like 55 and white. Yeah. So like, I don't really care. Are you going to listen to their taste in t- television shows and music? You know, yeah, there are a lot not. of food critics who wear cargo pants. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot. So I'm, I'm good on that. You're good. I'd like to go back to what you were saying about magic before. I know that's rewinding a little bit, but I thought that was really an interesting point. Can we revisit that? Like, what do you mean about finding the magic in stuff when you're writing about food? I went to Fukuoka, which is in Kyushu, and it's where ramen was invented. And ramen was only invented in like 1930 or something like that. It's not old. Like pizza is older than ramen. And so... A sort of thing that was weird to me, or unexpected, I should say, mm-hmm. was that there was a lot of tomato ramen, like tomato-based ramen broth was like a big thing. And it had been a big thing for like two or three years. So when I came back to New York, I was they were all asking, everyone was asking me what, how, what Japan was like. And I said, oh, you know, there was this tomato ramen that was like pretty good. And it was everywhere. And that people sort of like squinched their nose and they were like... Uh, that just sounds like runny spaghetti. Like I'm not on board with that. And I found that to be this kind of like magical revealing moment in that it sort of unveiled this sort of paradox of people who expressed adoration for all things Japanese, sushi and, and, and um, uh, goyoza and you know, miso soup and ramens sashimis but then if you told them what japanese people wanted to do with that food they were like no i don't they were basically saying what do japanese people know about ramen wow to me it was it was just this kind of like question of well what do you really like about ramen then what do you really like about japanese culture and Japanese cuisine, if you're not willing to follow where Japanese people themselves are leading you. Right. I wrote a story about it. I had a quote from a chef who said something that I think about all the time. What good is curiosity about a culture's past if you don't also have a curiosity about its future? And I think that's a really good, solid question to be asking yourselves at all times. You know, I also had this other story about food was leading gentrification in the Bronx, but it was something that we called henteification, um, which is a term that was coined in Los Angeles. And henteification, hente just means people in Spanish, like the people. So henteification is gentrification, but driven by locals. 
And I asked this guy in the Bronx who was making hot Cheeto flavored. I think he was, I think that was hot Cheeto flavored empanadas. Oh, that sounds amazing. And I said, look, if there were two white girls from Williamsburg or from Brooklyn who had a food truck that popped up in the Bronx and was selling hot Cheetos empanadas, they would be like run out, you know, with pitchforks. Yeah. Why is it okay if you make it? And he said this really compelling thing. He said, you know, I'm the first in my family to speak English. I'm the first in my family to be born here. I'm the first in my family to have a business. He said, I'm a new kind of Latino. I deserve a new kind of cuisine. Yeah, that's so powerful. shouldn't be condemned to his grandmother's recipes. And I thought that was, you know, that was like a very compelling case. We should allow for food to change. You know, one of the, actually, one of the other first major things that made me a food writer is I did like a big feature about, uh, I don't know if you even know this story, but I did a big feature about how weird food is in science fiction. No, I don't think I've seen this story. So science fiction is really good at showing me what clothes are going to look like in the future and what like car design and spaceship design and clothing design and and, like architecture is going to look like in the future, but has a really lame sense of food. Yeah. You know, like you think of like uh, George Jetson popping a pill. That's his breakfast, but the pill is like scrambled eggs. Right. Or Deanna Troy eating ice cream. Deanna Troy eating chocolate ice cream. But also I remember I did a lot about Star Trek, actually. It was a lot about Star Trek, but there was this thing where like Captain Picard, uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard, played by Patrick Stewart, you know, famously had a, like an affinity for uh, Earl Grey tea. And I was like, look, you're this 24th century explorer and you, you visited 500 planets and the best tea is still Earl Grey? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, so it just seemed very parochial. And also, you know, I don't really know what people are going to be drinking in in the 24th century, but it's not Earl Grey tea. For sure. So, you know, it's not imaginative. And the the irony is that, um, you know, major restaurants aren't really that imaginative. They're really just doing these sort of like grandmother's recipes. And uh, I, there was a, the, I, uh, an idea in the story that really the creative places are places that are very down market, like Taco Bell, where that, like, that rethinks what a burrito could be or rethinks what, you know, Pizza Hut rethinks what a, a pizza could be, right? Like Pizza Hut is going to invent stuffed crust pizza way before Mario Batali ever will. Yeah, and there's real innovation happening there, but we label it in this way that, I think elite food people look down on because it's Pizza Hut or because it's Taco Bell. Yeah, but it's really good. I mean, you know, there's that comical um, scene where David Chang orders Domino's, his like weird flatbread Domino's thing, which is really just like a sort of like snack. It's not really pizza. Right. It's like the Domino's version of a Flammkuchen or something. Yeah, and there's a lot of that. I remember, um, you know, I was doing a story... I did a story about Cheesecake Factory when it opened in New York because it was opening in Queens. It was not opening in Times Square. It was not a Bubba Gump, Shrimp Factory, you know, Olive Garden kind of place. It was opening in Queens, which meant it was opening for actual New Yorkers. And I went and the line of people who were waiting for it to open were almost all you know, people of color and immigrants. And then this one guy, I remember saying, he goes like, I mo- I came to New York because I was told that it had everything. Mm-hmm. And when it doesn't have Cheesecake Factory, which everyone else, like everyone else has their Cheesecake Factory for them is like where they went on a date in high school. Yeah. Right. And like a fan, like fancy date or something like that. And for immigrants, it was just part of the promise. It was that thing we were saying earlier, right? It was like 
you get it from reading the book, but you can't get it from watching the movie, right? That just is part of the lacking. And this guy said, I came to New York because I, it was promised that everything was in New York. And there's no cheesecake factory. So it felt like opening the fridge and seeing that it was full, but also seeing that it didn't have anything that you wanted. Wow. Like that's the kind of insight that you get when you don't look down on your nose at cheesecake factory coming to New York. For sure. Um, and you wonder why would cheesecake factory come and not be in Times Square? Like if you're looking down on it, as like mass produced or whatever, mass, mass market, then why aren't you curious about why it's not in Times Square? Because if it is coming to New York for mass market reasons, why isn't it in the mass market neighborhood? But that's also saying that Queens is not mass market, right? It's like real Queens New York. Queens is not market. really mass market, right? I mean, like, you know, there's not going to be an M&M store in Queens. Okay, fair enough. You know? Like it has a big population, but it's not like you can't just sort of rely on the traffic. Totally. I think chains like that play a role in expanding people's tastes or educating people's tastes. Like I remember when California Pizza Kitchen opened up when I was in high school. Like that's the, I had the tandoori chicken pizza and that's how I learned about tandoori chicken because I didn't grow up with Indian food, right? And like that was sort of the gateway drug to exploring Indian food in other places. Uh, so I'm all for that sort of thing. And also kind of jumping back to tomato ramen, I think there's this interesting kind of dynamic there where it's it's mostly sort of like white foodies who want to cast like primarily non-white cultures in in amber, right? And they have to stay the same, but it's, and like stay in their lanes, even though ramen is already the Japanese take on Chinese noodles. And so adding tomatoes, like it's not really that big of a deal. In a, what's that class of food called, uh, uh, Lishan? That's like, it's in Japanese, it's called Chinese food. Chuka is like the, the Japanese term, yeah. Chuka ryori. Yeah. So there's that, right? It's like, it's known as that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. I mean, once you deal with, once you look at foodies, it's like TV producers, editors, book editors, critics. I mean, they're all white, almost all white. And just to be fair, when I say all white, I don't mean all Irish people from the Northeast. I mean, you know, it's very possible to be uh, an Asian chef on a TV show and basically be performatively, functionally white. You know, there's like this a sort of, if you're not white skinned, you are at least, you're sort of uh, existing in a space of whiteness. Right. Or you're Asian and you went to culinary school and learned like French technique, which there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a, there's a certain type that gets replicated or it gets highlighted. There's this really boring idea of like, this chef is a refugee. Oh my God. You know, a lot of people are refugees. This person is like a black, a, you know, a black woman of color or whatever, like a, or, you know, um, uh, this and this and whatever, that kind of, that kind of, that kind of thing. It's remarkable. This is a sort of weird thing to say, but it's remarkable that the Trump administration hasn't changed more people's views on diversity because the Trump administration had the first openly gay cabinet member. It had the first immigrant first lady. It had Nikki Haley and Ben Carson. And we just had like this insane Supreme Court battle ended with a black Supreme Court justice swearing in a woman Supreme Court justice. Like that on its face is what the Democrats sort of like to say that they value, but it sort of shows the reality of it shows that you know, it needs to be about more than the sort of optics or the, or the demographics. But there can be plenty of immigrants like Melania Trump who are terrible. There right. can be plenty of black people like Ben Carson who are terrible. There can be plenty of South Asian women in the deep South, like Nikki Haley, who are terrible. There's, you know, versions of that in, uh, you know, in the Democratic Party as well. Right? You have... Um, Rahm Emanuel is terrible, you know, um, there's lots of, there's lots of, you know, versions of that. Right. That diversity doesn't equal goodness or 
back to magic, right? The like the magic immigrant or the magic refugee, and we need to get past some of these tropes. Yeah, it's really boring. It's really boring. And food has that same problem. You know, there's only one allowed, you know, like it's like Marcus Samuelson, David Chang, Padma Lakshmi, Jose Andres. None of these people are, are interfering with each other's territory. There's not five Padma Lakshmi's. There's not 10 David Changs. Right. But there are 10 Mario Batali's. And there For are sure. 10 like- Thomas Kellers. And there are 10, jo- you know, Joel Rubichons. And there are 10 Jean-Georges Vanga Richtens. And Rene uh, Redzepi's. But there's only one Marco Samuelson. And there's only one you know, whatever, all these other people. So it's just really boring. It not only is sort of isolating, but it sort of condemns those people to be these sort of performative people because they were inevitably asked to represent all of exoticism Yeah. in a way that, you know, Thomas Keller doesn't have to represent all of... All of France, right. Yeah, you can be like a French chef and like represent a specific region and be known for that versus the like the indian woman who's on tv talking about food talking about like all of that i think that people expect jean georges vanga richten to they don't expect him to be good at um paella right um which is like i don't know a stone's throw from france but they expect padma lakshmi to be have an informed perspective about pho. Yeah. It's kind of lose-lose for everybody, to be honest. You know, it's just, it's just really boring. I don't want to say that I'm any kind of like renegade or anything like that, but I just kind of don't presume that Padma Lakshmi has a great perspective on pho. And that's okay, right? That's great. Yeah, I think that's actually really great. Um, I think what you do is you find it on the, you know, you, you find the expertise and you find the information and you find the perspective and you find the passion on the individual terms of that mission. Thank you for sharing that perspective, Richard, and giving us a peek into your process. I like to flip and turn the tables. So you get to ask me whatever you want now. I don't know if your listeners know, but you know, you, you're kind of this polyglot not just in you know your understanding of languages and your knowledge of languages you're taiwanese but you know you kind of also claim japanese culture because of the sort of colonialism involved there yeah and i lived there for 3 years as an adult yeah and you also lived in sweden and know swedish and um you know you know sort of know a good amount of most european languages and and really follow a lot of these sort of niches. Also, also you grew up in Arizona, which is like low key basic, like no, no offense, <laughs> right? You were one of these people who thought that Cheesecake Factory was a fancy. Oh, totally. Yeah, I already talked about my California Pizza Kitchen revelation about tandoori chicken. So, what for you, like, excites you? You're you're really you're really well traveled. You're really well rounded. What was your tomato ramen? What was the thing that recently kind of set you off and like kind of like lit you up? You know, well, obviously not a whole lot of travel has happened this year. But for me, since the start of COVID, I moved to this small town on Long Island. And it's one of these uh, towns where there's like one Chinese restaurant, but it's actually like pretty well executed American style, like kind of Cantonese, Chinese food. And that stuff's kind of a dying breed. You know, I mean, you get like, you know, you get the Panda Express stuff everywhere, um, but Chinese restaurants are are closing across the country, which you wrote the story about. But like to find that, like sort of good, solid American Chinese food, I think for me is like really comforting. I'm glad we have it in this town. It's called Sing City here in Sag Harbor. And it's just stuff like that, like getting egg foo young and and stuff like that that is hard to find these days. And I'm glad that there's 
you know, newer waves of Chinese immigration bringing regional Chinese food, but like American style Chinese food is what I grew up with. And I'm, I'm glad that there's this family run place. That's not, you know, Panda Express. Yeah, Chinese American food is really at a turning point of like, is it going to last or sort of not, or, you know, how is it going to find a new, like new iteration? Cause what is existing now is just like, just not possible. Right. Um, what are your like weaknesses? What are your like uh, the thing that you're just a sucker? Like if I say this food, you're just a sucker for it. I mean, I'm definitely a real sucker for ramen. I also lived on Kyushu, which is the island that Fukuoka is on where you were talking about that. So I'm a real sucker for that. Although the regional specialty where I lived in Japan was known for like very thick, intense pork broth ramen. But I think with age, I can't stomach as much of that anymore. I also used to drink a whole lot more. So that was like the perfect kind of uh, hangover type food or like close out the night kind of food. So now I'm tending towards like lighter ramen broths, but I'm just a sucker for like noodles and, and slurpy things. Also for me, I'm like really, I, I really am averse to like, I'm kind of averse to like pecans kind of averse to eggplants hmm. there's like some things i'm just like not really into and is there something like that for you that you're just like mm, that's the thing that a lot of people like but like i just don't like it i don't know if a lot of people like this but as a half cantonese person i'm like i'm not into the the chicken feet at dim sum at all i know it's like some people have a whole sort of like pride about it or it's like oh i can eat the chicken feet but it's like it's not it's not worth the effort, you know, for a, like some grisly gelatinous kind of stuff. It doesn't, it just kind of soaks up the flavor of whatever sauce it's in too. So I just don't think it's worth it. So I always worry, you know, when people say, oh, it's a soul food restaurant and they really just mean a fried chicken and mashed potatoes and green beans and macaroni and cheese. Right. They don't mean boiled peanuts and chitlins and pickled pig's feet. Right. You know, some people are like, I love British food. And they just mean like shepherd's pie. They don't mean these nasty pickled eggs that are in every pub. Pickled yeah. hard-boiled eggs that are in every pub. There's literally a jar. It's just like pickled yeah. eggs. <laughs> so I don't even know what the deal is. But I just like it only because I grew up with it. Yeah. But yeah, there's a, there's a thing where people are like, oh, I like Chinese food. And they mean... You know, even real Chinese, like mapo tofu, right? But they just don't mean chicken's feet. Or like, I remember, I you know, I, when I lived in Chengdu, there was, we had these like cubes of jellied duck blood. And it's just like, I don't really miss that at all. No. Yeah, coagulated pork blood is a big thing in Taiwan too, like that appears in different things. And it's like, I'll eat it. Like, I'm not grossed out by it. I just don't find it particularly flavorful or something that I want to seek out. Yeah, it'd be really weird. There's a thing in Britain, black pudding. It's pig fat whipped with pig blood. That's it. And maybe like some salt or something. And I don't really miss it, but it's like, yeah, it's just like, oh, that's part of it. It's like the crazy uncle of food. You know, okay, yeah. Well, if you have a big feast, that's going to be part of it or whatever. But what's the thing that you wish you were into? Like, what, like you know, like that you wish you had a better understanding of? I wish I knew more about tea stuff, actually, you know, coming from like tea drinking cultures. I just drink whatever people make me or, um, you know, sometimes I drink Lipton and like the tea bag is fine. But I also have like fancy Taiwanese tea that my relatives send me. You know, I like it and it's good, but it's not like something I know a whole lot about. Like I probably know more about wine than tea stuff. So it's probably something I'd like to learn more about. Yeah, I know. There's this tea that my grandmother makes. She's 90 and British. And it's just instant tea. It's so instant that I think it might have like milk flavoring in the crystals. or. Whatever. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And it's, you know, but it's so, it's like so perfected that all other teas sort of become lesser than because it's not that. You know, it's like I would never want to eat a homemade Oreo. Would you ever, would you want a homemade Oreo? No. And like, I mean, it's fun to watch those, that genre of YouTube videos where you have like pastry chefs try to make them, but it's like never as good as the thing. Right. And it's like, so kind that, of, do you watch that woman? Her name is like Emily, I think. 
she made she just made like a sprite pie recently and she also made like a prison burrito <laughs> <laughs> just like wow okay All right. she's very i don't know she she does a lot of that sort of like i'm gonna make homemade oreo i feel like she, if i youtube homemade oreos one of her videos would pop up i feel like I've probably scrolled by those videos and I was like, oh, I don't really need to watch this. But it it's another one of those things where I feel like it's feeding the algorithm more than something that like actually feeds the soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- that Korean grandma really feeds the soul. Um, even though it's it's really, honestly, the Korean granddaughter is the sort of star of that show. Um, but I don't like those ones. Do you ever watch those ones that are like BuzzFeed videos of like... I'm 30 and I'm trying McDonald's for the first time. Yeah, I don't find that super interesting, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. I feel it because it's the whole thing is like, do you love, are you going to like be on camera saying you love it? Or like, it's a lot of like, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. Or like, what's the big deal? You know, this is kind of good. It's a lot of like, there's a lot of that kind of song and dance of like, it's kind of good. Would you recommend it or not? Yeah, I don't know if I want to be performing my like culinary cherry poppings on camera and like have to, you know, fake a food gasm about that. Yeah, there's a lot of performance and like there's a lot of taking a nibble and not like mashing it in your mouth, you know? Yeah. I always wonder on Bake Off, on Great British Bake Off, Paul and Prue or Mary, you know, they they take a bite. And I'm like, maybe that was just the wrong bite. Can you imagine being judged on just a bite? I mean, you really kind of have to sit down and have a whole thing. You know, one of the things that I that I wish that food writers did more is not just talk about portions, like, oh, this is a good portion, like economically big portion. But like, there's so many things where it's like, this is great on the first bite, but after 10 bites, I don't really want it. Yeah. I wish that people did that more because I think that's actually a key thing. There was this really great, I I can't believe I'm about to praise her, but Lena Dunham wrote a really good (laughs) obituary um, about Nora Ephron, uh, I think for the New Yorker and said that Nora Ephron's tip for dessert, like, like trick her hack for dessert was to order every single dessert and just have like one spoonful of each. So you have a little, like a little um, dessert. What are those things called? Like a flight, like a flight of dessert. Yeah, like a degustation or something. Yeah. So I mean, I think that that that's a certain kind of person, but there's a very different vibe to like finishing the Sunday. Yeah. You know, I mean, the first spoonful of the Sunday, fine, but like finishing it, I want to see. I want to see Deanna Troy finish the fucking Sunday. You know? Yeah. Or like the Instagram foodie, like actually eat the food, like full on mukbang, that sort of stuff. Right. And it's like, you know, it's like those chaotic milkshakes with like, yeah, like you did not eat that. Yeah. And I've never seen a half eaten one. You know, never. Easy cook. I don't know if it matters to your listeners, but like I am a food person who's not on Instagram or Twitter. And my, my Facebook is set to private. I'm not really tempted or lured by all of that stuff. So I think, I think it's really important to like maintain your own thought process and your own Mm -hmm. emotional process and your own sort of mental path Mm -hmm. about stuff because it's way too easy to get roped into Oh, well, I'm, you know, I want to do this, you know, Rachel Ray recipe for whatever, whatever. I don't care. You know, she makes dog food, man. I don't want, I don't want to eat the, I don't want to eat the food of someone who makes dog food. But it was done in 30 minutes, right? It's, it's done you in were, 30 if minutes. If you heard that Purina had a really good recipe for ramen, would you eat it? No, because it's just like, you can't get rid of that brand association. Yeah. Rachel Ray makes dog food. I'm good. <laughs> You know, it's like when Fashion Week people are like, I love Marc Jacobs. And I was like, you like the creative director of Diet Coke? That's your fashion choice? I'm good on that. Yeah, is this your God? (laughs) Is this your God? Yeah, exactly. You know, I would love to rewatch Black Panther and I wonder what the food was like there. 
I would love to know, like they must have made little like street food and things like that. When I wrote about that uh, Cheesecake Factory thing, I emailed Anthony Bourdain if he had any guilty pleasures. So I talked to I talked to like Z- Tim Zagat, and he said I think he said he liked Wendy's fries. He really liked French fries from Wendy's, if I'm remembering correctly. And Anthony Bourdain said that he really liked fried chicken from Popeyes. Oh, I love Popeyes. I I think that's the best fast food fried chicken for sure. Yeah, and you know it's just like you should be able to say things like that, right? Like I want to know. I don't really care about what this, what, what, you know, all the, the sort of pedigree of a food critic or a food writer. I want to know, do they even double up double stuff Oreos? You know, like I kind of want to know stuff like that. I want to know, like, what's your like basic stuff? What's your sort of guilty, guilty pleasure, or even like not guilty pleasure, like indulgent? I love double stuff Oreos, and I love doubling, d- doubling them up. There's a thing called like mega stuff Oreos or something like that, or like max, max stuff. I think it's called mega stuff. Those are good. Yeah. So final question, when we can travel again and you get to go back to Britain to visit family, what is like the first thing you're going to eat when you get off the plane? Oh, that's what I already know that. So it's literally at like Gatwick airport or whatever, right? Gatwick or Heathrow airport. I'm just going to go to a, um, I go to like the, like, I don't know, they're kind of like Walgreens and every place has like a, this I guess it's called like a meal deal. It's like a little triangle of a sandwich and potato chips and a, and a drink. And it's like three pounds or four pounds or something like that. Like a cheese plowman sandwich and salt and vinegar chips. And, um, like an elderflower soda, something like that. You know, it's like, it's not good. I mean, it's not amazing. But, you know, another thing that I tell people, because people sort of think that I'm, I don't know if you have the same problem too, but people sort of think that I know about every place they're ever going to go, like that I've been there or that I know a lot about it or something. And they say, you know, what should I do when I, I'm going to go to Paris, what should I do? And I always tell them, so if it's your first time in that place, you should go to like a McDonald's. And they're like, why would I do that? And I was like, well, first you'll have Wi-Fi, which you'll want. But secondly, you should eat something that you know, you know, the taste, the texture. People associate like, oh, the, the cheese is better in, in Tuscany or whatever. But also the, the FDA, you know, the equivalent of the FDA is different. The equivalent of you know, all that stuff, the agriculture department, the farming practices are different. That's kind of a major thing that people don't really think about that much. So that's a really key thing. I mean, like Starbucks in Korea is amazing, way better than Starbucks in America. There was this amazing drink in the Starbucks in Ireland. It's called a cereal latte. I literally ask Starbucks people here to make it and they just won't. They just don't have it, I guess. It's an oat milk latte with crushed Cheerios in it. And so when you drink it, it has the the caffeinated, it's hot and it's caffeinated. So that's the adult part. But it really feels like that moment in your childhood where you're pouring the the cereal, where you're, you know, tipping the bowl to have the cereal milk. It's really good. That sounds like the Starbucksification of some like milk bar thing. And I'm all for it. It's so good. It was really, really good. And but there's also this horrible potato chip latte in Starbucks in Korea that was nasty, but it was like wonderfully nasty. <laughs> you know, it's like ah, oh, I, I kind of want more of it. You know, I kind of want more of it. Yeah, Richard, thank you so much for sharing all of these insights from your travels, your writing, your life, and getting us to think about food and food writing in different ways. So this is great. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks so much. And our reader, our listeners, uh, check out gatherjournal.com. I'm not affiliated with it anymore or anything, but it's uh, it's pretty great. You can maybe find some like vintage copies on Amazon or something, eBay or something. Richard is at charmandrigger.com if you want to find him there. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Easy. 
this one is like just my podcast. It's not associated with like any of my institutional affiliations. So I feel much freer on this one. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. This is, this is uh, no strings attached, Lishan. Yeah. <laughs> uninhibited. Are you up for uninhibited play? Well, you know, this used to be like the original title was Easy Cook Slut. Um, but then it was just like, it was a little too much. It's There's a, a little thing limiting. called Egg Slut. I know. And that somebody pointed that out to me. And I was just like, it, it just seems like, okay, it's cool that it's provoking a little bit, but it also seemed a little bit too it's try It's very hard. brunchy. It's very brunchy. And it's also like, if you have to explain it to every single person, maybe that's okay for a branding thing, but it just seems kind of limiting. Some people will just say no to that, you know? Yeah, and I was just worried about that, about like, this is called Easy Cook Bear. Yeah, that's fine. That just, yeah, that's fine. Easy 